as to obey the traffic regulations. And our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, has always tried to do so. Especially since last week, when our beloved principal, Mr. Conklin, instituted another of his drive safely campaigns. Friday morning at breakfast, my landlady asked the reason. What's behind this campaign, Connie? Oh, same thing as last month, Mrs. Davis. Somebody parked too close to his car and scratched his bumper. And as if that wasn't enough, I got this ticket last Monday, right after he warned us about driving carefully. But you didn't tell me about it. I was afraid to mention it. If Mr. Conklin hears about it, I'm a goner. What kind of a ticket was it, Connie? For illegal parking? Not exactly. It's for speeding, going through a red light, reckless driving, <laughs> driving on the sidewalk, and hitting a fruit stand. <laughs> Well, my goodness, a person's entitled to a little fun once in a while. <laughs> you don't understand, Mrs. Davis. None of it was my fault. Oh, who was driving? Nobody. <laughs> I know you have much money, Connie, but if we sell my Hudson, you can go away for a nice long rest. I may go away without selling your Hudson. <laughs> Fortunately, I asked for a trial by jury. I'm sure I can prove my innocence to them. Well, I'm sure you can, dear. Now, how about proving it to me? Of course. <laughs> I simply ran out of gas, Mrs. Davis, so I parked my car on top of a hill and walked down to get some. Then some idiot tried to squeeze into the parking space behind my car, and in doing so, pushed it hard enough to start it rolling. When it came to a stop against the fruit stand, I ran over to try and back it off the sidewalk. That's when the policeman came over and wrote out this ticket. But, Connie, why didn't you apply the brakes before it hit the fruit stand? I told you I wasn't in the car. Oh. Well, couldn't you explain that to the policeman? I did. But he insisted that driving from outside the car is very dangerous. <laughs> listen to reason, and I've got to be in court today at 2 p.m. But school won't be over by 2. For me, it will. My problem now is to get off without Mr. Conklin knowing why. Oh, that's Walter Denton. He's driving me to school today. The mechanic is still picking peaches out of my sand belt. <laughs> Come in, Walter. I'll put up some more toast. Walter always likes to have his second breakfast with us. Well, Sadie and Sun in my universe. Sit down, Walter. I haven't come up yet. What makes you so chipper this morning? The movie I saw last night, William Bendix and Johnny Holiday. It shows that no matter how underprivileged you are, or that even if you run afoul of the law, there's still a way out. You didn't get here a minute too soon. <laughs> well, I was a little brought down after the movie, and when I took Harriet Conklin home, now, I wasn't on her porch five minutes before her father politely asked me to leave. Politely? I jumped down the steps before he could kick me. <laughs> What's the matter with you this morning, Miss Brooks? You look a little glum. I am a little, but I'd rather not discuss it if you don't mind. Oh, maybe I can help. What time? I'm afraid it's a secret, Walter. Tell the old Walter. I picked some cinnamon toast for us. Oh, too well, Mrs. Davis. And how are you this morning? I'm fine, thanks, but Miss Brooks could do with a little cheering up. That traffic ticket has her all upset. Mrs. Davis. So that's why you're glum. Well, when did you get the ticket, Miss Brooks? Last Monday, Walter, but I don't want anybody to know about it. Your secret will never pass my lips. So what did you get the ticket for? Well, according to the policeman who made it out, it's for speeding, going through a red light, reckless driving, driving on the sidewalk, and hitting a fruit stand. For that, you got a ticket? <laughs> well, you're sure cracking down, aren't you? <laughs> it wasn't her fault. She simply parked on the top of the hill to get some gas, which I'd run out of. Then when another car tried to park behind my car, it was pushed and started rolling down the hill. That's when it went through the red light, up on the sidewalk, and into the fruit stand. Yeah, but there's one thing I don't understand. What's that? Before your car hit the fruit stand...
What's that? Before your car hit the food stand, why didn't you put on the brakes? I had lost them playing canasta. <laughs> Look, I'll explain the gory details on our way down. Right now, I've got to figure out some way to get out of school so I can appear in court at 2 o'clock. Well, I can I do you, Miss Brooks. Why don't you just take the ticket down and show it to Mr. Conklin? Wonderful, Walter. Then I won't have to go to court at all. He'll hang me in his office. <laughs> beating Mr. Conklin to school this morning. His office door is open and he's not in it. Well, it's just as well. I'll have another few minutes to think up a good excuse for wanting this afternoon off. I'll keep you company till he shows up. Hey, come on, let's go in. All right. Hey, what's this by his desk? It's a fishing rod. Boy, look at this swell trout fly on the hook. Oh, I'm real good at fly casting. Hey, well, watch this, Miss Brooks. <coughs> look at me. I caught a waste basket. That isn't all you'll catch if Mr. Conklin walks in. Oh, it's pretty early for him. I guess old Marblehead, uh, Mr. Conklin, is planning a little fishing trip after school. Oh, boy, that's the life. Yeah, it must be fun at that. Fun? Here, Miss Brooks, just cast this pole. Uh, go ahead, grab hold. Like this? Right. Now, toss the hook at the waste basket. Go ahead, you won't hurt anything. Oh, but I've never done anything like this. Oh, <laughs> well, just throw it back first and then forward. Oh, there's nothing to it. Like this? Uh, oh, God! <laughs> what was that? I don't know, but it feels like a whopper. Reeling me in. I'll come quietly. Mr. Conklin, do I have any money to lie now? I just remembered my own part of the story. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Conklin. Here, let me help you get the hook out. I'll stand back. If I'm going to be filleted, I'll do it myself. <laughs> the knee of your trousers. I'll sew that up in no uh, time. Never mind, Miss Brooks. I'll have them repaired and send you the bill. Oh, good. Mr. Conklin, I know you're not the type of person to hold a grudge. Oh, I'm not, am I not? No, sir, you're not, sir, you're not. <laughs> That's why I'd like to ask you if I might have this afternoon off. What? Miss Brooks, as much as I need the rest, Request denied. Oh, but it's urgent, sir. I can't do all of this work. But Mr. Green... Yes, <laughs> Aye, aye, sir. Hi, Miss Brooks. Oh, hello, Harriet. I haven't seen much of you lately. Where in the world have you been fishing yourself? Me? I've been fishing. Fishing? You? That's right. You should have seen the one that just got off my hook. <laughs> morning classes, trying to devise some way of getting out of school gracefully to make my appointments with the 12 good men and true in traffic court. By lunchtime, I still hadn't thought of anything and could visualize myself as posing for snapshots with my license plate hanging on my chest. <laughs> However, when I met Mr. Boynton in the school cafeteria, I thought it best to conceal my dilemma. Oh, here's a nice table, Mr. Boynton. Let's sit down here. All right, Miss Brooks. May I hold your tray? If that's your best offer, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Boynton. Your gallantry is quite overwhelming this afternoon. It was very nice of you to pay the check for all this food. <laughs> Don't mention it, Miss Brooks. With that tray in your hands, I realized you'd have difficulty reaching into your purse. That was very thoughtful. You can give me back the 50 cents anytime. 
no hurry about it, Miss Brooks. I know that you know I like to keep my books straight, and you always pay your debt, so why should I worry about it? Mr. Boynton. I also know that you're well aware of the fact that I don't make any more money than you do, so... Well, it'd be rather a foolish gesture for me to actually treat for lunches. Mr. I Boynton. haven't a qualm in the world about, about laying out this 50 cents. I know I'll get it back. Maybe not today. Maybe, maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not even this week. But I know that someday, some way... Thanks. Welcome, Sporty. <laughs> now, let's begin, huh? Oh, fine. You know, I'm happy to see that your traffic ticket hasn't spoiled your appetite. No, I don't believe in letting... How did you know about my traffic ticket? Oh, well, Walter Denton told me about it. I teach him third-term biology, you know. Somebody should teach him to keep his mouth closed. He promised me that he wouldn't mention it. Oh, he told me he wasn't supposed to tell me before he told me. Oh, that's different. <laughs> You shouldn't brood about a traffic ticket, Miss Brooks, especially since you're completely innocent. There's just one thing I can't figure out about that accident, though. That's why you didn't slam on the brakes before you hit the fruit. Mr. Boynton, it's faith such as yours that gives me the courage to stand up and quit. If I have half as much Hi, trouble with that... Mr. Boynton, mind if I join you? The cafeteria stole the Kappa City. Mighty pretty country up there. Yeah, I'm How's the old pitching on Snodgrass? You think we're a big play city this year? Well, I hope so, Mr. Boyne. Right now, I'm not too worried about athletics or my personal physicality. It's the mentality I'm up with. I can't understand it. It's the final exam. They're coming up soon, and I think I might flunk some of them. In fact, the... There's only one subject I'm pretty sure I'll unflunk. Oh, what's that? English, English naturally. naturally. <laughs> My course. Now look, Stretch. The fact that I've been patient with you and tried to help you stay eligible for athletics shouldn't that influence you to relax in your study of English, you know. Oh, I won't, Miss Brooks. From here on in, I'm going to stick my head in my books and fall like mad. Well, you've certainly got the head for it. <laughs> well, it's still a few weeks, though, Stretch, and I'll help you all I can. Now, will you pass the mustard, please? Here you are, ma'am. Well, it sure does my heart good to see you eating. I thought sure your appetite would be shot. Shot? Why? Well, Walter Denton told me about your traffic ticket. You know, this would have been more of a secret if I'd published it in the newspaper. <laughs> Miss Brooks is completely innocent, Stretch. Well, I know. We all know it's just a bunch of cramped up charges. <laughs> when you tell a story in court, Miss Brooks, they'll let drop in a jaffy. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing to worry about. Thank you, Counselor. And remember, all us kids at school love you like our own mothers. So you can be sure you'll keep getting candy and things wherever they send you. They're not sending her anywhere, Stretch. Miss Brooks is going down to court, stand trial, and she'll be back with us in a matter of hours. Why, certainly, Fred. Of course, if something should go wrong... Well, is there any little gift or something you'd like to take with you? Yes, Mr. Boynton, there is. I saw a wonderful doll in Sherry's department store the other day. It's called a Tiny Tears doll. Oh, I've seen that. She cries real tears when you squeeze her. Well, lots of dolls do that. You keep out of this. <laughs> I always say it's up to the doll and who does the squeezing. <laughs> But I thought that a doll would be nice company in the cell you two have assigned me. Oh, gosh, Miss Brooks, I didn't mean it that way. I was only... Oh, mind if I join the group? Well, if it isn't Paul Revere. <laughs> I told Miss Brooks that you told me, Walter. What? Fine blabbermouth you are. <laughs> oh, look, Miss Brooks. I only told the people I thought would want to help you. So I tied you. I'm sure he meant well, Miss Brooks. We would like to help you plot some sort of a defense. I appreciate your interest, Mr. Boynton, but my immediate problem isn't the court itself, but how to get there. 
If you all excuse me now, I'm going to crimp up a bit and take one more crack at Mr. Conklin. Oh, certainly, Miss Brooks. What's the lot, Miss Brooks? Can yeah, I take a crack at him for me, Miss Brooks? <laughs> I won't see you later. Thanks for trying to help, boys. Oh, boys, there goes a fine, upstanding young woman. Those are the best kind. <laughs> She bucks up against Mr. Conklin. Now, we've got to figure some way we can spring Miss Brooks by 2 o'clock. Spring her? Yeah, get her out of here without Mr. Conklin knowing why. Now, wait a minute. I've got a thought. Suppose one of us were taken ill suddenly. Maybe we could get Mr. Conklin to let Miss Brooks take the stricken party home. Yeah. Then when they get off the school grounds, she could go to court, and the one who was suddenly taken ill can get suddenly taken well and blow for the day. No, I don't think that's a feasible plan, boys. At least as far as I'm concerned. Whenever I tell an untruth, I hiccup. It's psychosomatic. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. But, Mr. Boyd, if we don't try my scheme, what will we do? Well, we'll just have to think further, Walter. Okay. Now, you heard him, Stretch. Keep that old brain working. Please, not while I'm eating. <laughs> Lunch, Daddy. I just thought I'd stop by your office and see if you wanted something. Uh, no, thank you, Harriet. I'm quite full. I've been eating my heart out. I just received a call that cancels my fishing trip. What kind of a call, Daddy? I've been called for jury duty. You have to get out of it, Daddy. Harriet, jerking one civic duty is totally un American. Jury duty, like voting, is an honor and a privilege and a great American heritage. And I've weaseled out of it twice already. <laughs> I'd have to be there all today if it wasn't for some stubborn female who insisted on a jury trial for a traffic violation. She'll get a jury trial all right. But, Daddy, when do you have to leave school? At 1.30, Harriet. And whatever you do, keep my going a secret. The minute anyone knows I'm off the grounds, they start cutting classes. They've got all sorts of excuses, but I know it's the weather. On these lovely days, cutting is a great temptation. Is that why you were going fishing, Daddy? Yeah. Hush, child. <laughs> Run on your next class. Okay, Daddy. See you tonight. Six months I've been looking forward to casting this rod. Oh, what a beauty you are. Come in. Oh, it's you again. What now, Miss Brooks? I'd like to go home, Mr. Conklin. I don't feel well. <laughs> Not four hours ago, you harpooned me with a fish hook. And now you don't feel well. I'm not just thinking of myself, sir. It's the student. I might be suffering from something contagious. Excuse me, Miss Brooks, but I've got to talk to Mr. Conklin. What do you want, Benton? I'd like to go home, Mr. Conklin. I don't feel well. Well, what do you know, Miss Brooks? Benton's caught your malady already. Beat it, Walter. I'm working this side of the street. Be telling the truth, Mr. Conklin. Oh, really, Mr. Conklin? I'm thinking fast. I can't let Brooks try to take me home. I second the motion, Mr. Conklin. He must be sick. He looks terrible. Yes, he does. <laughs> but he's not sick. Oh, sure I am. Oh, so look at my tongue. Oh, oh. Move that up. Put it back in its holster. <laughs> I'd better take him home, Mr. Conklin, before this spread. Oh, Mr. Conklin. Yes, what is it, Snodgrass? I'm sick as a dog. Oh, fine. 
and it's an epidemic. Dropping like flies, aren't we? <laughs> I got dropped before my eyes. I guess it's my appendix. The spot looks like your appendix. Yeah, only bigger. Then would you say they look like my appendix? Uh, well, I got other things too, like the uh, remnantism. The infiltration of the sacral aliac. Uh, How about hardening of the artillery? I'm sure I got a touch of those. Amazing improvisation. Oh, that's been kicked off a lot too lately. Maybe Miss Brooks ought to take me home. I've already been spoken for, Stretch. Yes, Florence Nightingale is ministering to the wards today. Pardon me, Mr. Conklin. What do you want, Poison? Someone, someone had better take me home, sir. I don't feel very well. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I'm sick. <laughs> and what, pray, are you suffering from? It's only fair to warn you, Mr. Boynton, that we used up appendicitis, rheumatism, and hardening of the artillery. <laughs> now, see here, all of you, I know what's behind these shenanigans, and I won't stand for it. There'll be no cutting classes at this institution just because a few balmy days come along. I haven't time now to deliver the lecture you all so richly deserve. Suffice it to say, I'll deal with this problem later on. Now return to your classes at once. Dismiss! Let's go, fellas. Now that was a pretty scene. What do we do for an encore? Oh, we just wanted to help Miss Brooks. I guess we got our signals crossed. Hi, Miss Brooks. I left my Christmas. Hey, what are you all doing outside Daddy's office? We're trying to get him to do Miss Brooks a favor. You picked a pretty poor time to ask him for favors. He tried to cancel his fishing trip so he can leave school at 1.30 and... Oh, dear, I wasn't supposed to mention that. Harriet, did you say that your daddy's leaving the premises at 1.30? Yes, but you've got to promise not to let it go any further. It doesn't have to go any further. Excuse me, kids, but I'm going to take off right now. Well, good luck, Miss Brooks. Yeah, all the best to you, Miss Brooks. Oh, I don't know what came up that made our principal cancel his fishing trip, but I'll tell you one thing. <laughs> I'd hate to suck up against the one I ever had today. <laughs> Your Honor, as a firm believer in our American system of justice, I have confidence in the fairness and impartiality of this jury. And if it pleases the court, I should like to address my remarks directly to them. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Yes, Miss Brooks. I wonder how long it takes to become a trustee. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, I finally told the whole story of the accident, and largely so he could get out of court in time to go fishing, Mr. Conklin joined the rest of the jury in letting me off with a rather severe fine. That was Friday. The next two days were spent in a mad, gay whirl of sorting through those of my personal belongings which would bring the most in a hawk shop. But Sunday afternoon, I determined to relax, so I headed for our front porch. Hello, Connie, dear. Look who I've invited for tea. Why, it's Walter and Harriet. Oh, Hi, Hi, Miss Brooks. Oh, I'm here, too. Mr. Boynton. Well, this is a surprise. Hello, Miss Brooks. You've been punished enough, my dear, so when Mrs. Davis asked me to tea, I took it as an opportunity to bury the hatchet. Oops. <laughs> I didn't mean it literally. Come back here. But I brought my portable radio on. I thought maybe we could hear the ball game while we're having tea. Not now, Walter. Miss Brooks wants to relax. The 
Somebody just stopped in front of the house. Yes, he's coming up to the porch. Uh, pardon me, folks, but I've lost my road map. Can somebody tell me which way is due west? Oh, sure. It's on your west. Uh, that is, if you're driving due north. Of course, if you're driving due south, then due west is on your right. <laughs> Unless you're left-handed, then you drive straight up. <laughs> Just what is your destination, young man? Uh, Hollywood, California. My name is Steve Allen. Yeah. Well, judging from the hand you got on this porch, you must be famous. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't say that. Unless I was tricked into it. <clears throat> I'm just an up-and-I-hope-coming radio comedian. I'm going out to Hollywood to replace Eve Arden for the summer. Oh, Eve Arden, I've heard of her. She's a living doll. <laughs> uh, she's the one who plays the school teacher with my name, isn't she? Yeah, Miss Brooks, that's her. Oh, there are some awfully cute characters on that show. One kid in particular. <laughs> some of them are all right. But there's one that leaves me cold. Nobody could be such a stuffy, pompous, puffed-up windbag as that principal of theirs. <laughs> oh, I don't know. There are people like that spread all over the country. And people like that should be spread all over the country. <laughs> but if you'll excuse me now, I've got to get back to my car and turn on the radio. You see, Eve Arden promised me that she'd give me a nice send-off on her last show, and it's just about time for it. Well, you don't have to go to your car. We've got a radio right here. Turn it on, Walter. Okay, Harriet. And so, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Colgate Palm Olive Peak Company, I'd like to thank you all for being such a faithful audience during the past two years, and to assure you that we'll be back again on September 3rd. Meanwhile, you will be entertained by one of America's fastest-growing comedy stars. I'm six feet past my collar now. <laughs> A young man of great wit and charm. Named Steve Allen. Named Steve Allen. And I, for one, will be listening to his program each and every one of the 13 weeks he broadcasts in our time spot. Good night, and thanks again. Well, that's that. Shut it off, Walter. Yes, sir. That was a lovely speech Miss Arden made. Uh, it certainly was. I can't help wondering, though, if she'll really listen to every one of my 13 broadcasts. What else have I got to do? You've got my job. <laughs> Next week, tune in to the new Steve Allen Show. Brought to you by Luxor Cream Shampoo for soft 